Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and welcome to this session on HIV self-testing. Um, I'm Peter Godfrey Fawcett from UNAIDS, the science advisor. I have the privilege to chair an advisory group for the STAR project, and therefore they asked me to act as the master of ceremonies to get you to all sit down, because we have much more exciting people to talk to you than, than me for the course of the day. Well done for staying this first pre-day. I hope you're not exhausted before we even get to the opening ceremony. Um, we know, we've already heard, I'm sure you've all been in the other sessions, that we are making considerable progress, um, but that there's still not only a gap in the first 90 in the, in the people who know their status, but that when we drill down onto that, we can find really significant gaps in particular areas, in particular populations, in particular genders, in particular age groups. And one of the approaches that has been proposed to try to address some of those gaps is whether or not self-testing could be an appropriate mechanism. And I think that UNITAID, therefore, really took off by getting engaged at an early stage in exploring how HIV self-tests could be part of that solution. And they made some early investments in the area of self-testing. And I think that now we're seeing a lot of other people are engaged in the area of self-testing. Um, and the STAR project, which is going to present its, its, some of its findings today and the, and the direction forward for the next phase, um, has been generating evidence through action on the ground um, already in, in three countries that we'll talk about and subsequently in some more. So I would like to pass to my co-chair for this first part of, the, of this session, um, Lelio Mamora, who is the executive director of UNITAID, which has been funding the STAR projects. And Lelio, some opening remarks, please. Thank you very much, Peter. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Um, let me first thank Peter Gottfried Fawcett for accepting um, moderating this panel today. Uh, it's an honor having you here and, and moderating the panel. I would also, also like to, to thank uh, the teams, PSI, WHO, and uh, LSHTM for organizing this event. And a special thanks for the team uh, implementing this grant it was brilliantly implemented. The, the team of PSI, of uh, WHO, LSHTM, um, FSH, and, and also, of course, UNITAID. Uh, special thanks to, to Heather Ingold, the portfolio manager, who has done a brilliant job. Actually, uh, we will share with you some news today, and he's also under her portfolio. As you know, as you may know, the STAR project is a $23 million project, started three and a half years ago. It's the largest HIV self-test initiative to date, implemented in Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi. And it was a great catalyst to create a powerful market uh, in the area of HIV self-test in, in low- and middle-income countries. And we hope it will, it will help us uh, start implementing the usage and the normal inclusion in the national strategies of, of uh, self-testing. It evaluated feasibility and adaptability of the HIV self-testing kits. Uh, it piloted different delivery uh, and distribution systems. It also generated a lot of data used by WHO for guidance and, uh, and other aspects. Um, it gave us a lot of data for governments starting taking political decisions of including the, 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 the self-test kit as part, as a regular part of the, of the HIV response. And finally, it also started generating some very interesting dynamics in the market of uh, HIV self-tests. Now we have uh, pre-qualified products, we have many manufacturers looking at the self-testing world as something very interesting and, um, and as, a, as a huge opportunity in the developing world. So we are thrilled to share the results of STAR-1 today with you. 
but we also would like to share some uh, news about self-testing. Literally, as we speak, we are preparing the documents for starting new projects in self-test. We have decided to partner with uh, Soltis. It's a very good French NGO for conducting a project. The name of the project will be Atlas in Western Central Africa. So uh, this region will be the next big center of uh, our investment in HIV self-testing. We are also starting, a, we are thrilled to start a very interesting project with MTV Sugar for demand creation. So we will be partnering with them in the next couple of years and we are starting now. Our board just gave the green light for working in these two areas. But the most important probably today is that we have also an approval for the STAR 2, the new STAR project, which will include another three countries. It will include Lesotho, Swaziland and South Africa, the biggest potential market in Africa for self-tests. And I would like to take this opportunity to now help really taking advantage of your presence here to sign the grant with Carl Hoffman and Miriel Mazo, who are here. So if Carl wants to step in and Miriam too, we will very quickly sign the grant. We can sign, well, this was, this is very <laughs> informal, as you see, <laughs> but. So this is a very important moment because the, the, now the, the total investments in the, uh, HIV self-testing in the portfolio of Unitaid will be more than $100 million. These are very important grants today. This is a 50 million between the two organizations and uh, we will be, this is actually a record time for signing a grant. After literally 48 hours of the approval of the board, we're signing the grant, which is really, really makes us very happy. So thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs> With that, let me very quickly introduce a very good friend of us and someone I admire a lot, Ambassador Debbie Burks. Debbie uh, was a role model for me when I was at the Global Fund. She has been managing brilliantly BEPFAR for a number of years now with a lot of success. And it's an honor and a pleasure having her next to me. And uh, welcome, Debbie. Thank you. Um, and wasn't that exciting to have self-testing um, studies done in West, West Central Africa? So hopefully this will accelerate us all to a new place. I think we are very um, excited about this concept. And I'm just thrilled with what Unitaid has done in what they we're supposed to be doing is being catalytic for the rest of us to do these pilot programmings, find out what works and how it works so then we can take it to scale. We just completed our country operational plan planning um, with many of you and self-testing is in every single one of them based on the work that Unitaid has done to date with PSI and others and I think and part of the STAR program. That was extraordinary because when we look at the progress towards the fast track in the 90-90-90, when you look at the FIAs and one being released tomorrow, Swaziland, you can see very clearly that we know precisely who we're missing. And so when we talk about 50% of people knowing their status or 77% 
in, in East and Southern Africa are 70%, you realize that it's 80 plus percent women and less than 50% men. And if you're under 35, less than 30% in most of the countries. And if you're a 25-year-old woman and not pregnant, in the 40% range. And it's those individuals that we think self-testing with text uh, telling them about self-testing and where to pick it up um, will be extraordinary. Um, I also think it decreases an amazing amount of stigma because when you ask uh, an, a person who has been found to be positive to bring in their partners to the health center, what if they have more than one partner? They're not going to want to bring four different partners to the health center. And I think this has kept us from having access to really provide prevention messages and treatment messages to those who need it the most. And I think this type of approach is going to be very exciting. Already, because of the work that was done, there's um, a plan for doing over a million self-tests in the next 12 months as part of the PEPFAR program. So we're, we're excited. We want to push you faster and harder. And I think um, everybody knows that we're not very patient at PEPFAR. Um, the P in PEPFAR does not stand for patience. So we really like to um, push and push hard to really, because this is about saving lives and changing the course of the pandemic. And I think when you start to accelerate, like we all have done together, you have to accelerate to the end. I think it's a novel opportunity for us to develop collectively the policies that are needed at every single one of the countries to see whether self-testing can count towards that first test so that when they come to the health center and having the confirmatory test, they go immediately on treatment at same day, same site start, allowing us to really streamline healthcare and healthcare delivery in a way where it's clear to the client that we believe that their health is so important to us that they need to get on treatment immediately, both to decrease their viral load so their immune cells can thrive, but also to decrease transmission. And I think we are at a really exciting opportunity to really see the acceptability. We know, particularly from all the surveys that we've done and the three combination prevention studies that we have in the field, that men are particularly elusive. We know they have to be there because of all of Koresha and Slim Karim's data, we see their viruses in young women. So we know that they are in physical proximity to where the young women are, we cannot find them. So I think the self-test says we don't have to physically find them. We have to find the individuals who interact with them in their social interactions and get them tests and then make it clear in their messages that either if they're negative or positive, that the health center stands ready to provide prevention interventions as well as treatment interventions. And so this is very important to PEPFAR. Thank you for being a leader. Thank you to all of you in the audience that have been part of STAR. We depended on your data. We used your data. And I think most importantly, we translated your data into immediately utilizing it in program. And that's what we should be doing. And that's how quick the cycle should be. Quick for signing your grant cycle, but we should be quick in taking these catalytic, innovative pieces. And we need to continually push WHO for pre-qualification of our um, different testing methodologies so that we can get things to the field quickly through our programs. So thank you. We're excited about the next 12 months. And we we'll, hopefully we'll come back here next year with showing how absolutely impactful this has changed the ability for young men to know their status as well as young women and really changing the course of the pandemic in under 35 year olds. So thank you. Thanks Debbie very much for encouragement and, and for all the work that, that PEPFAR has been doing. And it's fantastic that in the, the new COPS, there's gonna be a, a lot of investment in, in this area because I think this is really exciting. Um, so, we're here in the city of Paris, um, and when I got a message about TDF, my first reaction was to think that it was to do with tenofovir and PrEP. But when we talk about fast cycles and going through the grant cycle quickly, others are thinking of other fast cycles, and Chris Froome is at, his, at this moment racing towards the Arc de Triomphe to win the Tour de France. And so it's highly appropriate that to welcome us here to Paris, we should have an important French um, physician. 
uh, Professor Kremier um, has been involved in, in HIV testing largely in the Ile de Paris, in the, in the central area of Paris where most of the affected population live through much of her career as, as an infectious disease physician. Um, she's currently a professor of infectious disease at St. Louis Hospital Paris um, and she's going to welcome us to Paris and give us some thoughts from her perspective in, here in France. Professor, professor Kremier, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this uh, very special session on self-testing uh, and uh, a warm welcome to Paris uh, and uh, uh, the behalf of uh, the National French Agency for Aid uh, Research. I will um, take the opportunity of these few minutes of introduction to briefly relate the history of cell testing in France, one of the first country, along with the US, to have legalized self-testing. Uh, As you know, in France, uh, HIV epidemic is highly concentrated in key populations. Urban areas are particularly affected, and almost half of uh, the HIV French cases are newly diagnosed in the metropolitan Paris regions. Several studies included uh, the study of uh, my team performed in emergency department have shown that around 16% of people living with HIV are unaware of their infection. But more important, those, um, those people almost all exclusively belong to high-risk population. They have been tested before, but were never retested. And those studies highlighted the importance of retested key population. Thus, the question is, is self-testing able to reduce the number of undiagnosed infection by encouraging key populations to repeat tests? Uh, HIV uh, cell testing was legalized in France in 2013. Cell tests were available in pharmacists in 2015. And in one year, around 140,000 tests were sold in French pharmacies. To overcome the barrier of price, which is still very important in France, uh, the price is 28 euro per test. There is a joint initiative of the president of the Metropolitan Paris region, Valérie Pécresse, and the mayor of Paris, Anne Hidalgo, for free or low cost HIV cell tests. And there is an ongoing study to evaluate if cell tests are going to enhance the frequency of tests in the, the high-risk gay population in Paris. But today we are here to learn more about self-testing in Africa. Clearly, we, shall, we have to commend our colleagues from the STAR project who face a much more difficult situation, a much more difficult task than we do in a country with generalized epidemic and also which strike, which affect disproportionately some groups such as young adolescents, young women MSMs and sex worker. I will choose when to test, where I want to test, is a very nice, explicit and empowering title of a very recent publication of the Star Investigator and uh, on the preference of young people to, be, uh, to use self-test. As a former head of an STD and HIV center for uh, testing, I always, I often realized that when people are ready, are finally ready to be tested, 
There is a window of opportunity that we sh should not miss by long delay or by difficult access to testing center. People want to be tested at the moment they are ready. Today we'll be hearing uh, the results of this very important work of the STAR uh, team and their amazing and very encouraging result on uh, HIV self-test. We will discuss with panelists on the remaining research question that will be addressed during the next phase of their, of their project. And, uh, well, that's done, officially launched uh, the next uh, STAR uh, phase. Now I want to pass uh, the microphone uh, to uh, the uh, STAR uh, team who will uh, introduce uh, their project and, pre and share with us uh, their magnificent experiences. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Cremier. Um, and we're going to have a slight rearrangement now while um, so the panel can step down and the first panel please could come up to the chair. There weren't quite enough seats at the table to fit everyone here. So thank you to our um, chairs and, and panelists for the first session. Um, many of our panelists today were featured on that publication that you just saw from Professor Cremier. So it's very nice to have hot off the press and sitting up here at the table as well. In fact, I think almost all of the people sitting at the table were on that paper. We're going to start off by asking um, Karen Hatzold, who's the leader of the director of the STAR project um, and a director at um, PSI, to give us a quick overview of what STAR is all about. And then we will go into the panel discussion of some of the, some of the detail. So I'm going to ask um, Karen from PSI to, she's led us all here really, so it's tremendous to see you here, Karen, and to be in this situation. And I'm sure she'll give a nice overview of where we've come from. Thank you very much for the nice introductions, Peter. Mesdames et messieurs, bonjour. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the session. Um, before we're going into the findings of this first phase of the HIV self-testing, the STAR project, by my share colleagues, um, with two scientific panels, um, I will give you a very quick overview of the rationale and the context of the HIV self-testing project, and also telling you what we're trying to achieve with this project. To introduce our partners, uh, the United funded HIV self-testing uh, STAR initiative is implemented by a consortium lent by PSI, Population Service International, in collaboration with WHO and a number of international and local African research institutes under the helmet of the London School of Hygiene. We have heard it already, the 1990s. Um, the global community is working towards achieving the 90s. Um, and there remains still a significant gap in achievement of the first 90s, which is ensuring 90% of people living with HIV knowing their status. These are the results from the latest um, UNAIDS report that was just released. And you can see, I mean, 90%, uh, 70% of the global population of living with, uh, people living with HIV um, have been tested for uh, know their HIV status. Um, and here you can see also in Eastern and Southern Africa, 76% of the people living with HIV know their status now. But there is still a gap to reach the 90s. And obviously achieving the subsequent 90s is dependent on the achievement of the first 90s, making improvements in HIV testing coverage the backbone of the achievements of the 90s in general. Um, so HIV self-testing comes in here as very important. Uptake of testing and knowledge of status amongst people living with HIV is particularly low amongst men, we have heard it many times now, adolescents and um, also key populations. HIV self-testing where a person collects the sample, either blood or oral fluids, conducts the test and um, interpretates the test on his own in privacy, um, may address some of the key bottlenecks that um, currently prevents these populations from uptaking HIV self-testing. Uh, HIV testing, sorry. This is the framework of impact, the impact framework for HIV self-testing. It shows you the public health impact, potential public health impact of HIV self-testing. 
We know that HIV safe testing can increase the uptake around certain populations, but it also can uh, increase, and um, Professor Cremieux alluded to this, the test testing frequency of people um, who are at high risk of HIV infection, like sex workers, MSM, or other key populations. Um, so um, HIV safe testing could really achieve a significant health impact here. First, by identifying the people living with HIV earlier, or those who have not undergone testing through other conventional testing services, then link them into treatment, um, and also then obviously decreasing morbidity and mortality of people living with HIV if they are identified, and reducing HIV transmission from those who are on treatment, obviously, and new infections. Secondly, and that is also very important, identifying HIV negatives whom we are reaching, whom we are linking into prevention services like PrEP or VMMC. And third, there's another third potential impact of HIV self-testing. By testing them rapidly with a screening tool, HIV negatives are pulled out of the health delivery system and providing potential cost and time savings to the health system overall. Um, as they don't require testing in the public sector healthcare facilities um, by healthcare workers. So there might be also additional impacts on the right-hand side, on the uh, additional impact in terms of social and economic be uh, uh, benefits in reducing stigma, for example. So STAR is building uh, the evidence of the public health impact where it does not yet exist, um, and which is very critical also for encouraging the investment of large global and also local governments. So, um, to, so with so much, sorry, um, so with, oh, my, my slide is, um, we have done a, a landscape analysis actually to see, and this is not the slide, um, where we identified, where we identified the market for HIV, potential market for HIV self-testing in nine sub-Saharan African countries. Um, and we saw that um, by 2020, um, the market share for HIV safe testing could be between 13.5 13 and 15.5 million um, um, self-test kits. Um, the STAR project, and these are the four outcomes of the STAR project that you can see here, um, is um, the, the, the project is, as I said already, um, implemented in three countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, currently in Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. And we are now expanding into three additional countries, which are South Africa, Swaziland, and Lesotho. The project is designed to support the HIV self-testing um, development by increasing access to HIV self-testing, by determining how best to deliver HIV self-testing to different service delivery models and to achieve the highest health impact. It also increases the demand for, for consumers of HIV self-test kits using market strategy um, that are informed by consumer insights and about um, the consumer path to purchase. And it reduces also barriers in the enabling environment by establishing policies um, to at global level and also at local level. As you know, um, STAR contributed also to the release of the WHO guidelines of H on HIV self-testing that were released in December last year. And we have worked with many governments actually of introducing or including HIV self-testing policies in these countries. Fourth is removing structural barriers, and that's very important to a market entry. So by including clarification for the regulatory environment at global and local level, and also encouraging market entry by making inform information about the market more readily available. And again, major achievements have been done with two products um, receiving ERPD approval. And very recently, actually, as of two days ago, we have won our first product that has WHO PQ pre-qualification. So very happy about this. This is the market size that I wanted to show you first. So the research agenda um, what, that we are talking about this afternoon and where my colleagues will be presenting on, on some of the findings. Um, the research under the first phase is designed to answer questions of how to deliver HIV self-testing, how to generate HIV self-testing demand, what are the costs and cost effectiveness of HIV self-testing, and what are the potential public health impact. So research is implemented through two phases, and you hear about this from the panelists, the formative research, the first um, phase of this, and then also the definite multi-country evaluation. So today, we summarize some of our key learnings. Uh, I think we have a total of 77 publications coming out of this research, so we have to reduce ourselves to two panels of scientific inf uh, information. 
um, all of which is very current and, and will also provide us with some um, foresight of the future efforts to develop uh, a healthy market for HIV self-testing. Thank you very much. Over to my colleagues. Karen, thank you so much. Um, so we're going to push straight on now into the first of the scientific panels. Um, and to introduce that panel, I'd like to introduce um, Professor Francis Cowan, who is Professor of Global Health at Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Um, she's also the director of SESHAR in, in Harare, Zimbabwe, which is where she's based full time and has been now for some many years. She can tell us quite how many years. So she's really a Zimbabwean, despite her Liverpool appellation. Um, and she's going to introduce some of the, the formative science around the validity of testing and some of the economics. Francis. Good evening, everybody. It's great to see so many of you here. So as Peter said, I'm going to introduce the um, work that has been done, a, a very uh, brief overview of some of the work that we've done to inform the scale-up of self-testing in the three star countries. So we're going to start with Dr. Euphemia Sabanda, who works with me at the Center for Sexual Health and HIV AIDS Research in Zimbabwe. Uh, she leads our uh, sexual health and HIV prevention uh, portfolio, and she's going to talk to us about the usability and validity of oral fluid self-tests among intended users and she's presenting experiences from across the three star countries. Thank you, Euphemia. Good evening. I'll start by acknowledging my star colleagues who have contributed to this talk. So in this presentation, first of all, I'll talk about the importance of optimization of user instructions for self-testing, and then talk about how we went about it within the STAR project in the three countries. I'll also present results of how participants are able to produce accuracy, accurate self-test results um, using oral fluid self-tests, and I'll end by giving you a glimpse of the work that we plan to do using blood-based self-test kits. Obviously, for someone to produce an accurate self-test, they need to have good understanding of the self-testing process and how they can read and correctly interpret the results. So the importance of understandable instructions cannot be overestimated. With this view, we conducted research in order to get an understanding of how well participants understand instructions for self-testing and use, to use these results to open, optimize the instructions so that we can enhance accurate self-testing. This was an iterative process that we followed, and you can see some pictures on the right of the slide where we are showing how we moved from one version of instructions to the next based on findings that we got from participants. We used various methods, the first of which was cognitive interviewing, which I'll talk about in more detail in a moment. And we also did video recording and analysis of participants when they were doing self-testing alone, unassisted. And this was an important procedure that allowed us to get an understanding of why some participants were not able to produce accurate results. We then conducted some accuracy studies where we compared the results of uh, self-testing with those of a provider delivered confirmatory test in order to see how well participants were able to produce accurate results. And one of our mandate or objectives as STAR is to support countries to adopt self-testing and given the importance of understandable self-test instructions, we've been working on a toolkit that can um, help countries to develop understandable instructions for their own setting. And that toolkit development has been informed by the results that we have had from STAR. So now going on to the cognitive interviews and telling you more detail about them. These were conducted by our trained social science researchers 
who would sit together with the participant and go step by step on each instruction uh, and ask the participant what they understood from the instruction and then have the participant perform the instruction as they understood it with appropriate probing in order to understand how the participant had gotten that understanding so as to inform how the instructions could be optimized. In all the three countries, we recruited both rural and urban participants. So what did we find from the cognitive interviews? We found that interpretation of symbols, which we use in our instructional materials, really depends on context and people's experiences. If you see that picture on the top um, right, that, that was the picture that we intended in Zimbabwe at first to illustrate that individuals were not supposed to eat just before self-testing. But as you can see from the slide, the picture was not always understood as expected. We then changed it to the picture below where we had um, cutlery and um, we had a line across it and people seemed to understand it in Zimbabwe. But when we took this instruction to Zambia and Malawi, we found that people did, had, str had struggles understanding this picture and so we had further iterations of the picture. We also find that, found from the cognitive interviews that the layout of instructions is important so that it's clear to participants which instructions need to be read first. And the organization of the packaging was obviously very important. We had a situation in Zimbabwe where we had a stand that was made of cardboard material and participants had trouble finding this because they thought it was part of the integral part of the um, packaging. And also one of the, our findings was that special instructions may not be adequate. This is where, for example, you tell a participant that open the bottom pouch or the top pouch, but really the top or bottom depends on how the participant is holding it. So we found that it was necessary to be very clear about that. And the importance of good translation couldn't be um, overemphasized. And we found the, imp the purpose and use of equipment was also important or not understood well. Where you can see the picture on the left is showing what was intended to happen, but on the right it shows that participants did not always do what was intended, resulting in spillage of the developer solution. So going on to the accuracy studies, I will talk about what we did in terms of the accuracy studies where we compared our self-test results with the national algorithm which is the finger prick blood-based test. In Zimbabwe, we were using different iterations of the self-test instructions um, and in the end we recruited 303 participants with the various iterations that we were using and participants were either observed or not. The majority of observation was done in Zimbabwe and was less important as we went to Malawi and Zambia because a lot of iterations had already been done in terms of um, observations using the video. And here are the accuracy results that we found from the three countries. Please to note that the figures are excluding participants with invalid self-tests. That's why some of the figures may not be adding up. And that for the Zimbabwe, we are using results from the final iteration of uh, instructions. And when you're looking across the three countries, we found that there was very good agreement between the self-test result and the result of the provider. And also we had good sensitivity and specificity. What we also found across the three countries was that in accuracy improved with demonstration. In Zimbabwe, we used a video, a, a very short video that could even be shared by social media, and we found that it helped participants to understand the instructions. And we also found that participants of lower accuracy struggled in terms of, so participants of, of, who came from rural areas struggled in terms of accuracy, and we attributed this to limited life experiences with such gadgets and also lower accuracy, lower literacy. So the test that we use in our study is a second generation test and many of you know about the limitations of second generation tests in terms of um, challenges detecting um, early HIV infection. So because of this we also wanted to see how well this test compared with the 
fourth generation gold standard, and we did this as part of the Zambian study. And as you can see, the sensitivity was suboptimal. Um, but however, of note is that we also looked at how well the gold standard, the local standard of care standard of the local standard of care of fingerprint testing compared with the laboratory fourth generation standard, and we found also that it also had suboptimal sensitivity. So what can we conclude from the work that we've done so far? We found that optimization of IFUs is really important and that there are marked differences between rural and urban participants. And what we've recommended, even in the toolkit that we are doing right now, is that it's important to do cognitive interviews and accuracy studies so that tools can be optimized. We found that in the three contexts in Zambia, Malawi, and Zimbabwe, demonstration is really important because it helps participants understand better. And the video that we de developed in Zimbabwe, we found it to be very useful as a tool for this de demonstration. However, we found that the second generation tests do not have optimal sensitivity against the fourth generation gold standard. But this was not related to just self-testing. It is clear that it's a limitation of the second generation tests which can either be provided, delivered or, uh, or self-tested. Now going on to just give you a glimpse of what we plan to do in the next phase. In the next few months, we are going to still do some optimization of instructions, this time with two blood-based tests, one which is a third generation test, and we're going to test the accuracy of these two tests among both the general population and female sex workers, and use the same population to also get an idea of what are user preferences um, for the two blood-based tests. I would like to end by thanking the participants, without whom we would not have had this study, and also to thank the ministries of health in all the three countries who have provided their support for the study. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Euphemia. Um, moving swiftly on, I'm now going to introduce um, Fern Terris Prestholt, who's an associate professor of the economics of HIV at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she's going to talk to us about the critical role of determining user preferences when you're developing models for distribution and linkage uh, from self-testing. Thank you, Fern. Excellent, thank you, Francis. So I don't need to introduce my title anymore. Um, so I'm going to move straight on to, nope, there we go. Um, so I'm just gonna t talk to you a little bit about our methods, our findings, and our next steps. But first of all, I'd like to recognize the team that we've been working in multidisciplinary um, teams across four countries and in five institutions, and we've been working horizontally across, but also bringing our research together. So I'd like to thank everyone who's contributed and just acknowledge the size of our team and uh, how much work and people have been involved. Um, I think many people are probably in, uh, comfortable what a focus group discussion is and what an uh, individual interview or in, um, IDI is. Um, in-depth interview, but I wanted to introduce to you the, what DCEs are, because that's a more a quantitative approach that complements the qualitative work. So discrete choice experiments are an approach from economics where we quantitatively estimate um, the strength of preferences. And it's a survey-based method where often we, we um, introduce a series of um, choices for individuals to make, and we'll ask individuals to choose between, for example, here we have distribution one, distribution two, and opt out, if you, and then we ask individuals to choose between these options, and based on the choices that they make, we can estimate the strength of their preferences. So for example, here we have, um, in distribution one, we have a pharmacy distribution of an oral HIV self-test distributed for free. Distribution two, we have a community-based health worker 
who will perform a blood-based test for you at Ten Quacha, or you might choose not to be tested at all. This very much builds on the qualitative phase, so uh, all the cognitive type interviews that Euphemia was talking about, it's absolutely necessary to ensure that the salient attributes are there, what makes people make their choices, and that people understand the images, that we are drawing images that are clear to them and clear to us. We repeat these scenarios, and by analyzing those, those choices, we can get actually quantitative measures. So I'm going to show you what that actually means and how we can bring together the qualitative research with a quantitative approach to prioritize our choices and inform the design of our, our um, interventions. Just as a really quick overview of the intensity of this the formative phase, we had over 150 qualitative interviews and almost 3,000 DC interviews. So it's a pretty big study. Um, so I'm going to move on to our findings. So thank you, Professor Kamu, for introducing our study. And uh, Peach is over there in the audience. Uh, she's the first author. We um, brought together our qualitative and our DCE data to consider young people's preferences for HIV self-test um, delivery and also to synergize. So I know that there's a lot on this slide, but it's just really to emphasize that we had the parallel analysis of the qualitative work with the DCE to really both of us looking at what are the young people's preferences for HIV self-test delivery and then triangulating across pr um, preferences for product characteristics, provider characteristics, and service characteristics. So when you see DCE results, we see on uh, preferences on the left side of the central axis, those are disutilities or, or relatively disliked characteristics, and on the right side, relatively liked characteristics. And what we can do with DCEs is that if you look at home-based uh, delivery in Zimbabwe, we see a utility of 0 0.7. 0 0.7 doesn't mean anything, but what it does mean is that it's almost as valued as strongly as mobile clinics are disliked. So that's what the value is of adding a quantitative method. Um, so we brought this together, and uh, as Professor Kramer mentioned, um, the importance of young people wanting to be able to choose. So I'll choose when to test, where I want to test, and I can determine how private the place of testing is. And this, again, is reinforced by our DCE results and our appreciation of H uh, oral fluid test in allowing us to do that. Uh, moreover, um, this quote really uh, um, enforces the, um, the disadvantages of some of the more public um, things. People can't be going to a hospital for an HIV test. Once I go there, the news is going to be spread everywhere and people will know that so-and-so is HIV positive. So that's reinforced again by the dislike for mobile clinics and health facility testing. And young people would, there was a lot of, there wasn't a very strong preference uh, for or against um, pre or post test support, but the counselor must be there, but not during the entire process. So the flexibility um, that um, self-testing allows. Now moving on to a poster that Euphemia is presenting, uh, so you can go and look at her poster later. Uh, there is a, a emphasis on economic issues driving preferences, so we see it's economic in terms of time. Let's say the hospital is far, you can just test at home, so that's an advantage of HIV self-testing, and it's consistent. Um, to some extent, this is the opportunity cost of time, but also if you do have to pay um, young pe um, people are, are saying that it, they may not be willing to pay. Um, and if you look at the poster, you'll see more issues uh, that are not economic as well. As an economist, I'm a little bit biased, of course. Um, so the third poster I wanted to just uh, slightly bring to light is, is issues around linkage to care. And here we pull data across Malawi and Zambia, and we see that phone calls were preferred for post-test support. Um, and having a fee or waiting time would be a strong barrier to linkage. But their uh, preferences are not always consistent. So in Malawi, there was a strong preference against all waiting together, um, regardless of facility type, which wasn't seen in Zambia. So our next steps, well, we've now shown you some preferences, assuming that everyone is the same. But the nice thing about DCEs is, and, and, and uh, this formative work is we can do sub-analyses and really start to tailor our design to the users. Who's failing to test and what do they want? And so these are some of the different dimensions that we will be looking at to better understand and reach those uh, men, as, as Debbie mentioned, 
Um, and then another study that we're going to do, again, looking at demand and preferences and also segmenting the market. So you may be able to have some people willing to pay, but not others. And this is a study that will actually offer vouchers at different prices and see who is willing to pay, who isn't, and how does that initial price that was offered affect their later willingness to pay. So that, what are the key messages I hope you take away from this? Is that it is worth investing in, in these research networks. We were able to get country-driven, uh, high-quality uh, cross-country analyses that have supported a lot of the robust evidence, allowing us to um, support high uptake. Um, people like HIV self-testing but are concerned about price and anonymity. There are consistent preferences across country in, in, in favor of home distribution by lay counselors and against mobile testing and distribution by partners. This may not be everyone, though, so no, these are just general. Um, and in, uh, dif differing preferences between pre around P and post test um, support. Further analysis of variation in preference will help us to target better and de develop more users-centered uh, interventions, including um, working with the private sector and willingness to pay analysis. My time is up. I just wanted to highlight a few posters if you're interested in looking at some of this in more depth and uh, talking to any of the co-authors on there. So thank you very much. So thank you very much both to Fern and Euphemia. Um, we now have uh, about 10 minutes um, where people can ask questions about the formative research or get more information about the studies. Um, we've got several panelists up here. So in addition to Fern and Euphemia, who you've already met, um, we have Sue uh, Naparella Mavidzengi, who's with the Women's Global Health Imperative at uh, RTI in San Francisco, who's done work specifically related to self-testing in key populations. And we have Alwyn Mawinga, who's the director of Zambart uh, in Zambia. So I have some questions prepared in case none of you have questions specifically you wanted to ask. Uh, but I'm hoping that there might be some questions from the audience specifically related to the preparatory and formative work. Yeah, so um, I can see one, one behind the camera and then Nancy, yeah. Thank you very much to the whole panel for such interesting presentations of the findings of the STAR study. I would like to bring in something can, that we've just... Can you just... introduce yourself always? Thanks very much. Of course. Constance Mackworth Young from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Zambart. And I'd just like to bring in something that we heard from the satellite just now on adolescents and young people, which was something that was said by a young person on the young people panel uh, about self-testing, saying, if I'm alone, what if I test positive? The next thing, I would go hang myself because there's no one to tell me about HIV and I don't know what HIV is about. And so I just wanted to bring this in to think about um, whether we should be doing anything differently with young people and whether this is something that you've seen so far in the research that you've been doing with STAR, whether this is a voice that has come out in your qualitative interviews um, and what we should be doing to give young people the support after they might test positive. Okay, thank you. Um, Nancy, can we have your question as well and then we can... And my question is, I didn't hear anything about the need for verifying a positive test. And it seems to me that that's a linchpin and we went straight to sort of linkage to care. And I was wondering in terms of preferences or is that in fact an obstacle and how are you overcoming it? Okay, thank you. Okay, so who would, who would like to tackle the question on adolescents? Yes, I can. Is this on? So I can answer the question on adolescents. We did a lot of qualitative research among adolescents to understand their views on self-testing. And overwhelmingly what the adolescents are saying, they are really excited about this opportunity to be able to self-test themselves and they see a lot of um, empowerment from self-testing. The views about the negative aspects of um, how to deal with this and a positive result were mentioned, but they were a smaller voice, a more minority voice, compared to the overwhelming excitement that self-testing is offering to 
young people who feel that they didn't have opportunities to test before and now they have them and they can test in private we, we, in a way that they can control. So that was a smaller finding uh, of when young people are really excited. And I, perhaps I can just add that I think uh, for many of the studies, for instance, we do have some studies in Zambia that are actually looking at the, the whole aspect of social harms from a wider perspective. So it is something we are thinking about and we'll be able to report on it. I, I would just add that um, the, the data to date uh, do in fact show that young people are amongst the highest uptakers of self-testing. And I think um, what Fern was just presenting, I mean, that subpopulation of young people is one of the subgroup analyses and their needs for counseling is certainly something that I'm sure her group is going to be looking at. Um, the major of the results has been done in, in people above the age of 16 years. Um, so we have, uh, we're looking now at roots at um, the expansion into South Africa where the age of consent for testing is um, 12 years and above. Um, so I think we need to do more studies as well in, in those in this age group 12 to 16 or 12 to 15 to see whether adolescents can accurately test and what the implications for this is. I think um, our research is answering main, mainly questions to adolescents above the age of 16. Just uh, at the risk of c continuing this for too long, um, one of the things is self-testing doesn't necessarily mean testing completely alone. So for example, um, we find sex workers are less likely to take the test away and are more likely to test on site where they can get easy access to confirmatory testing immediately afterwards. And our perception of that is because they are more likely, they feel they're more likely to be HIV positive and they want to be around people who can give them post-test support. So it allows them to test, have the moment of privacy about finding out their results, uh, but then can be in a, a situation where they can get confirmatory testing really easily. Alwyn, I was wondering if you wanted to say anything about confirmatory testing. Yes, I think the, the, it is understood that this is just a screening test. So when we've done the studies, the, the people who test are actually referred to the clinics to have the confirmatory test. So that is quite understood that is a screening test. Yeah. Okay, are there any other questions? Yeah. Hi, this is Jessica Haber from Boston in the US. I saw on one of the slides, and I apologize if I missed it, but that the invalid tests were excluded. Um, how many invalid tests were there, and could that have affected your sensitivity and specificity? So there were a very small number of invalid tests. For Zimbabwe, where we looked at the final iteration among 40 participants, one of the 40 participants had an invalid test. And for both Zambia and Malawi, only 0.3% of participants had invalid tests. So we're talking about very small numbers. Okay, thank you. We, can I just take one more, um, perhaps from this side? We haven't had anyone from this thank side. Thank you so much. Um, Joyce Mwale uh, from Zambia, Japaigo. Um, it's good that we are having so many preferences in HIV testing, but I just want to know the selection criteria, given that uh, some of the participants were not even able to translate the pictorial instructions. How did you um, manage to overcome this and didn't it affect the results? Thank you. Okay, so that sounds... So we recruited participants who came for HIV testing at health facilities and we purposefully wanted to include both participants of high literacy and those of lower literacy so that we could look at feasibility of self-tests even among people of lower literacy. And the findings were helpful for us in terms of seeing how we can simplify instructions for the benefit of everyone in the general population. I'm not sure if 
for him answering. Has that answered your question? So they were, a re they were, they were not a, a research sample. They were people who consecutively turned up to be HIV tested at a, self, at a testing facility, not a self-testing facility. Well, though we did advertise in advance in the communities that, that self-testing or provider-delivered testing would be available. So let's give a big hand to our first panel. As with all enthusiastic, with all enthusiastic research teams, they've got an awful lot they want to tell us and we're a little bit squashed for time. So I'd like to invite our next panel to come up for some of the more evaluative work. This work will be co-chaired um, by Cheryl Johnson. We've already heard a lot from the countries, the researchers in country, from PSI, who's a, as people know, an NGO, an implementer, both locally and internationally. Cheryl Johnson, who's coming up, is from the World Health Organization. And it has to be said that Cheryl has really been pushing this process extremely hard, ably supported by her supervisor, Dr. Rachel Bagley. Um, and I think that the WHO has really been pushing. I think you'll hopefully all be aware that they pushed through the new guidance from WHO on both self-testing and on partner notification or index testing as, as Debbie Burks referred to it in her, in her remarks in some of the earlier sessions. So they're a key component of the STAR consortium um, and drive the process forward. So Cheryl um, will introduce the, the next panel as they come and sit down and help us through. Cheryl. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, Peter. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening as we go into the evening hour here at 6 o'clock. Um, so we're going to have a really prestigious panel talking through some of the implementation and, and results. Um, so our first presenter will be Miriam Mutetsa uh, from Zimbabwe, and she will be talking with us uh, about community-based approaches and a lot of her work. So after Miriam, we'll also have a doc our soon-to-be doctor, Augustine Choco uh, from Malawi Liverpool Welcome Trust. We'll be talking about the results from his study, um, and then we have additional speakers, but I see Miriam will be ready to start soon, so I don't want to keep her. Um, so thank you so much, Miriam. Thank you, Cheryl, for the introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will present to you some of the results from the STAR Phase 1 project in Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. The impact on uptake of HIV testing and other programmatic experiences with the, the STAR project in the three countries. To deliver the HIV self-test kits, the STAR project has used a diversity of distribution models these fall into three broad categories, facility-based, community-based, and open access. To date, STAR has employed seven distribution models in its programs. In an upcoming expansion of the project, STAR will also examine HIV self-test use in PrEP programs. Selection of a channel is dependent on the target populations to be reached, the level of supervision required to ensure accurate testing, and whether or not product subsidy will be applied. Given that the bulk of STAR distribution to date has been in community-based models, the bulk of the data presented here will focus on this channel. Nearly 500,000 test kits were distributed in the three STAR countries, mostly through community-based distribution. In Zimbabwe, Facility-based distribution through the existing network of HIV testing services clinics contributed to 13% of the overall number of test kits distributed. In Zambia, public sector facilities and distribution through VMMC mobilizers contributed about 10% of the test kits distributed. There was a very limited distribution of HIV self-test kits outside of community-based distribution in Malawi. Most of the HIV self-test kit distribution was conducted at community level through different cadres of community healthcare workers. Community-based distribution also included workplaces and urban hotspots. Community-based distributors conducted demonstrations on how to perform the test. A video was also used to show and shown on the tablets. Community healthcare workers 
collected demographic data and past testing history from self-testers electronically on tablets. Self-testers used retained Self-testers users retained used test kits in sealed envelopes in collection boxes that were placed at community level. Now I'll show you the results. The data presented here is based on the demographic information from self-testers collected by community healthcare workers. You can see that in the first year of test kit distribution, 44% in Zimbabwe, 51% in Zambia, and 49% in Malawi were men. 28% in Zimbabwe, 47% in Zambia, 50% in Malawi were young people 16 to 24 years. 23% in Zimbabwe, 21% in Zambia, and 26% in Malawi were first-time testers. Based on population-based surveys that were conducted at baseline before HIV self-test kits were distributed at household level in the communities and after distribution, we can see that between 2016 to 2017, self-testing increased HIV testing coverage, which is testing in the last 12 months, by 22% among women and by 24% among men in Malawi, by 4% among women and by 21% among men in Zambia, and by 35% among men and 28% among women in Zimbabwe. A much more pronounced increase in testing uptake in men than in women suggests that many men may have been reluctant to test through provider-delivered testing, but see HIV self-testing as their option to find out about their status in private and to their convenience. There was a significant increase in the proportion of adolescents 16 to 24 years taking up HIV testing after HIV self-testing was introduced at community level. The increase of uptake was more marked in this young age group than in the older age groups above 24 years. Approximately 50% of female and 80% of male self-testers with reactive self-test result linked to confirmative testing and HIV treatment in Zimbabwe. This compares to 50% female and 51% male clients tested through community provider delivered HIV testing linking to care in Zimbabwe. The results presented here are based on late read and retained test kits from self-testers reached through different distribution channels. Retain rate was between 43% community-based distribution in Zambia and 99% facility-based HIV self-testing in Zimbabwe. It shows you that the percentage of self-testers with a reactive test result, the highest positivity rate was observed among sex workers in Malawi. 38% tested positive using a self-test. HIV positivity rate was observed among self-testers reached through community-based distribution, varying between 4% in Malawi and 18% in Zambia. Nevertheless, we have to look at this result with caution, as we observed challenges with stability of the test results when re-read after 72 hours. Results presented here might therefore overestimate the positivity rate of self-testers in this study. PSI has started offering self-test kits as alternative option to conventional provider-delivered HIV testing services at four of its urban HIV testing and treatment clinics in September 2016. HIV self-testing and provider-delivered testing was offered in a parallel or as opt-out option. We hypothesized that HIV self-testing used as a triage test could re relieve human resource challenges with HIV testing services through task shifting to the self-tester, increase efficiency of service delivery through increased client flow, and increase FA HIV testing coverage. Participants opting for HIV self-testing were shown a short instructional video. This has been mentioned. One counselor was available to facilitate linkage for self-testers 
needing on-site confirmative testing and the antiretroviral therapy. Demographics were captured electronically. Self-testers were asked to retain used kits to log the drop boxes. Used kits were re-read by a professional and reactive results were used to estimate positivity rates. To HIV positive index clients, we offered to take a test kit home for partner testing. Now the results. The data presented here from Zimbabwe highlight a critical point about potential of HIV self-testing in facilities. Uptake of HIV self-testing when offered alongside provider-delivered testing was approximately 30%. After shifting to opt-out, it was nearly 90%. HIV positivity among those who self-tested was significantly lower than those who opted to, for a provider-delivered test. This suggests that low-risk individuals may opt for self-testing. Translated to a crowded public clinic where provider-initiated testing is limited, HIV self-testing could effectively screen individuals in the facility focusing resources on populations most likely to test positive and require more focused care. Based on studies, we know that, for, we know that fear of a positive HIV test result and fear of HIV testing in general prevents men in Southern Africa from seeking VMMC services. We also assessed whether HIV self-testing offered to men and reached through community mobilization for male circumcision could increase uptake of male circumcision services. We measured uptake of male circumcision among adult men 16 years and above who had been reached by community mobilizers and accepted HIV self-tests and compared this to uptake of male circumcision among men who had not received an HIV self-test prior to to male circumcision. So the results, as you will see, when comparing uptake of VMMC from men who, reached, who were reached by mobilizers who also provided HIV self-test kits, men were more likely to take up VMMC, 57% as compared to 42% of men took up VMMC without the HIV self-test option. So in summary, our programmatic evaluation is shown HIV self-testing reaches undiagnosed positive men, adolescents, and first-time testers. Early linkage to confirmative testing, treatment, and care services among positive self-testers. Used as a triage test, HIV self-testing might increase efficiency freeing counselor time previously spent on testing HIV-negative individuals to focus on those with reactive results needing further testing and initiation on ART. HIV self-testing potentially improves partner notification or index testing through secondary distribution. HIV self-testing increases likelihood and motivation for uptake of VMMC. Those may, are my acknowledgements to all who are working with us on the implementation program and the contact details. Thank you very much. So, similar to the first panel, we'll hold all the questions to the end. So I'd just to like to invite our next speaker, uh, Augustine Choco, to present about his results. Um, he'll be presenting... Oh. He will be presenting on some results um, from his, the PASTEL trial on improving linkage to treatment and prevention after self-testing. Uh, thank you very much, Cheryl. And I'm really pleased to be here and to present these results for the first time, actually. Uh, and the issue of uh, the struggle for us to narrow the gap between men and women has been emphasized already. So this study really uh, looked at uh, improving linkage to treatment and prevention after testing or self-testing among male partners of antenatal care attendees, a much arm adaptive class randomized trial that we did in Malawi. The research question was, uh, how can 
we identify candidate interventions for improving uh, the, the uptake of testing as well as linkage after testing among male partners of pregnant women. And the background has been emphasized already. The conventional testing methods are so far failing men in many ways. Uh, and we know that post-test linkage is the one that really drives the cost effectiveness in terms of uh, uh, HIV testing. Uh, and because men lag behind, uh, we see that highly effective prevention options uh, are not utilized. So these include voluntary male, medical male circumcision, uh, couples testing, for example. And for, for men whose partners are pregnant, uh, it's a real opportunity really to reach out to both partners. And we know that women do test routinely. Over 95% in Malawi do test routinely when they are pregnant and come to the antenatal clinic. So this is a mat arm mat stage uh, class and randomized trial. It's a, it was designed to be a small study, so a phase two study, uh, including methods development for the study design, as well as a formative uh, qualitative study that was published in the Journal of International Aid Society in the, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the last two weeks to look at what are the interventions that we can come up with to, to address the issue. Uh, so the unit of randomization, and this is important to, to understand, is the antenatal clinic day. So a day is randomized to any one of the, uh, the, 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 the arms that are shown on the diagram. The first one is the standard of care, which is just a, a letter written to the male partner inviting him to come to the clinic to have a test and to take up uh, the additional services. Across the five intervention arms that we ended up with, uh, we then provided the woman uh, with two self-test kits to take home if they, uh, she was randomized, uh, if that day was randomized to, to that particular arm. Uh, additionally, in the, uh, in the three other arms, we provided financial incentives. The first one was simply to meet the transport cost, which was a $3 incentive. The next one was $3 plus, uh, plus an additional $7 to, to also compensate for opportunity cost. Uh, the other one was a lottery, which was equivalent to the transport equivalent, uh, to, to the transport uh, arm. Uh, and the final arm was a reminder. So we made a phone call to the male partner on the day the woman uh, came to the dental clinic, and again also after five days. So one interim analysis was, was, was embedded within the design. So the, the first stage uh, had all those six arms. And then we did a, a, an analysis aiming then to drop some arms that were not significantly better than the standard of care and then proceed to randomize another set of antenatal clinic days to the remaining arms. So the objective was really to, uh, to estimate the effect size for the interventions uh, and also to look at whether this model is acceptable and whether it is cost effective indeed. The primary outcome was the proportion of male partners tested and linked uh, within 28 days uh, for either care or prevention. Uh, another very important outcome was the proportion of men who linked uh, successfully for ART or uh, voluntary male, medical male circumcision. We also had four secondary outcomes that are listed on the slide. So the first stage had uh, uh, six arms, like I said. We randomized 36 antenatal clinic days to these six arms. Uh, and in those, in those 36 uh, clinic days, there were uh, 1,084 women who were eligible. Uh, and we re-interviewed women after four weeks. And this was 70% of women were re-interviewed uh, after four weeks. In the second stage, uh, actually, I have to say the lottery arm was dropped, so I can say that. You're going to see the data soon. Uh, in the second stage, we had 35 antenatal clinic days, uh, and 1,265 women were eligible, uh, with quite an improvement in terms of women re-interviewed. After four weeks, we had 90%. Baseline characteristics that I just selected were reasonably balanced, but I uh, just want to highlight that there were some differences in terms of past testing history by the male partner. And so this was adjusted for in the analysis that I'm going to present. 
So really exciting to share the primary outcome results, and this is adjusted, like I said, for the past testing history of the male partner, as reported by the woman. Uh, and what you see on, on the right-hand side is that we had 676 men coming back to the clinic. So the testing was evidenced by a counselor. This is not self-reported. 676, 29% of men came back uh, of the 2,350 uh, women who were randomized. 44% were testing for the first time, uh, and 630, 93% were confirmed HIV negative, uh, with the majority already circumcised. Uh, 46%, 7% tested positive, uh, and we didn't have any serious adverse events. Uh, like I said, the rotary arm was dropped, uh, and then this, this figure is just then showing the effect sizes for each intervention arm uh, for the primary outcome. And what you see really is that the two fixed financial incentive arms are the ones uh, that were significantly improved the outcome of testing and linkage, uh, whereas the lottery and just providing the self-test kits only uh, actually did not improve that particular outcome. Then we looked at the outcome of proportion of men start, uh, refer, referred for ART or being referred for circumcision within 28 days. Uh, and what you see, uh, the black is the percentage uh, starting treatment, uh, and the yellow, I apologize for, my, for being color blind, so maybe that is not yellow, uh, uh, is men referred for VMMC, and the gray is the, the, the combination of those two outcomes. And again, what you see, the just providing self-test kits only did not improve the primary outcome, but you can see here that it, it seems to improve this particular outcome, which we call active events. Uh, however, the lottery, again, did not improve that particular outcome. This, this is very exciting because it has also been shown in Kenya uh, that when you provide kits this way, it actually improves significantly the self-reported proportion of men who uh, test. Uh, uh, so, as you can see, the standard of care is 17%, which is if we don't do this, and self-test kits in terms, the, the uptake was between 87% to 95%. To summarize, this particular model was uh, quite highly acceptable, and we didn't have any serious adverse events. And this trial answers a major question of how can we add more uh, if, uh, proven interventions to self-testing, such as voluntary medical male circumcision. Uh, and what we've seen is that the, the two financial incentive arms did improve uh, that particular outcome. Uh, I'm also quite excited that the incremental cost per man tested or linked to ART of MMC was lowest in the, uh, uh, in the financial incentive arms. Uh, uh, and, and also, this is going to inform large-scale study that is uh, actually in the pipeline for the STAR project. So uh, it's quite very exciting for me personally. Uh, I would like to end by acknowledging everybody who has been involved, including study participants, uh, and thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. So I'm just going to introduce Hendra Morthy uh, Mahasramaran, and uh, he's going to be presenting on the cost and cost effectiveness. Um, so thank you so much. Hi, so I'm... <clears throat> Andrew Morthy Maheswan. So um, I'm presenting findings from the costing, cost factors and modeling work that we're undertaking as part of STAR. And this work has been done by myself, Valentina, and Tom Summer, and Fern. So the, the, all this kind of work is being done alongside the impact evaluation of the different self-testing models that Miriam described. And the approach we're following is uh, with, al alongside all these trials, we're undertaking costing studies to estimate the costs of delivering the self-testing and also other forms of testing that are provided at the studies. This allows us to then undertake an economic evaluation of the testing model and also to look at what the impact at a country national level is of introducing uh, self-testing. And finally, uh, the information then is 
is used to adapt the, the widely used spectrum goals model that is designed to inform program managers about the uh, impact of scaling up self-testing. So the, the costing of uh, self-testing is being led by FERN and what we've done so far is we've looked at the cost of providing traditional forms of facility-based testing at these sites as well as the community distribution models. And the general approach is we try and follow the same methodological approach so this aids comparison across different countries. And what we do is we look at the, all the resources that are used in providing the testing uh, services, and then we, as, then we assign market values to each resource to the, uh, therefore allow us to estimate the total health provider costs. Additionally, we, uh, we look at the outputs of the different services in terms of I numbers of people who tested and also the numbers of HIV positive individuals identified. And therefore, what we do is we estimate the unit costs per individual tested and also HIV positive individual identified. So at health facilities doing the traditional, not self-testing, but the traditional council-led testing service, we found that the, the mean cost per individual tested ranged from 4 to $8, uh, whilst the mean cost for HIV positive identified ranged from 70 to $180. And the graph on the right shows that at health facility, at larger health facilities are seeing more numbers, the actual cost per person tested or the unit costs are lower. And often these testing sites are at urban settings serving quite large catchment populations. Um, for self-testing, um, so we've, we've looked at the cost of the community distribution models. And so far, the, of the ones that we've completed, we've identified the, the cost per individual self-tested to range from about eight to nine dollars and that's slightly that's comparable to the facility-based testing and what the the graph on the uh, the table on the right shows is all, is the high numbers of men who do access self-testing obviously we've also estimated the cost per person um, to identify HIV positive individual but often that's quite difficult because of the kind of the confidential issue, issue of disclosing self-test results so additionally to that, the information we do from the, the costing studies then feeds into a model-based analysis of the self-testing model at the sites. So th as we're still waiting for data to come in, I'm just presenting findings from the cost effects analysis we did in Malawi at the initial self-testing cluster randomized trials that Prof. Cor uh, Liz Corbett did. And in that model, we were providing self-testing through lay trained health volunteers to an urban population in Blanta with high HIV prevalence and low ART and uh, HIV testing coverage. And at, that, at the time of the trial, Malawi was following the 20, uh, 2010 WHO guidelines where individuals are started at CD4 counts below 350 or pregnant. Since then, Malawi has adopted the 2016. So when we looked at the economic valuation, we considered both the 2010 and the 2015 guidelines. And then the actual model is a non-transmission model, and it takes into account the costs of self-testing and facility testing, the costs of providing HIV treatment, and the implications of suffering HIV-associated comorbidities. And the aim is to estimate the incremental cost per quality adjusted life year gained. A quality is comparable to a DALI, it's just the opposite way of measuring it. And it takes into account both the impact on mortality and morbidity. So this is a, a cost effectiveness acceptability frontier, which is one of the things that we health economists like to present the findings on for policymakers. And what the, the graph shows is of the four strategies, that, of the four testing and ART treatment strategies we explored, which is the optimal strategy at increasing willingness to pay or cost effectiveness thresholds? Often in cost effectiveness studies in, in sub-Saharan Africa, we use the GDP one and two, three times GDP to interpret cost effectiveness. So in Malawi, the GDP is about $250 per capita. And what you find is that the least costly strategy is obviously going to be uh, only providing for say, testing initiating at 350. At it, when you, if you're willing to pay more at higher cost effect thresholds, self-testing is cost effective. Uh, and importantly, what we f show is that actually, that if you're going to adopt the 2615 ART guidelines, it makes sense to add in additional forms of testing that can reach people with earlier, um, 
with early infection who are otherwise asymptomatic and may not access services. So uh, Vantino is doing um, additional, uh, a, a different type of cost effectiveness work where she's looking at the, at the national level. And this is a lot more complicated modeling where it takes into account the impact of transmission. And the aim is to explore what factors will affect the cost effectiveness of introducing self-testing at countries and national level. And in, in this kind of analysis, it takes into account, so initially what she's looked at is the, uh, providing community-based testing, this especially targeting young men, so young people, men, and uh, female sex workers. And, and, and the setting was actually in Zimbabwe, and incorporates the impact and transmission. It takes into account the, the accuracy of the self-test kits and changes in, in sexual behavior after testing. And the main findings from that, uh, from that um, findings was that actually we will need additional forms of self-testing to reach the tw uh, nine, UN First 90. Um, interventions that involve additional tests uh, uh, may not be cost effective unless the cost per self-testing can come quite low. And the important thing with uh, the analysis is that it highlights the need to link HIV negative individuals into prevention services. So finally, Tom uh, Sumner is looking at the adapting the goal spectrum model. And I'm sure everyone knows that the goal spectrum model is used to inform program managers about the, the burden of HIV and project the future uh, impact of different interventions. And the aim that he's doing is trying to add in a self-testing sub-module to the module. So this is an example of the goals module. And what it does is that the program managers have a user interface to begin at the front where they enter aspects of their program, i.e. in terms of the coverage of HIV testing and sorry, ART and other prevention services. The model then runs some analysis and feeds out to the, to the user what the impact will be in terms of future infections and mortality impact, as well as also the human and financial resource implications. And what Tom is doing is adding in an additional sub-module that the user can add in uh, the different types of self-testing modules and what the coverage and uptake is. And, and the outputs would also then be the number of people who are self-testing and the, the, the burden on health services instead of ART coverage. So in conclusion, we found that HIV self-testing can be delivered at comparable cost to facility-based services that uh, community-based system mo models are cost-effective, especially in low ART coverage and uh, testing uh, populations, and it's especially suited towards an early diagnosis and treatment strategy. At the country level, there are, it, it's, we're still uncertain about the cost-effectiveness, but if the test kits, if the self-testing can be delivered at lower cost, then it's likely to be cost-effective and also the importance of linking HIV-negative individuals to prevention care. Thanks. Hendy, thank you very much. Um, so we have another brief interlude for you to ask your questions. I'm afraid we are running short of time, so please take to a microphone. We've had sessions on um, thinking about the, the cost effectiveness, we've had sessions about the accuracy, we've had sessions about linkage. So let's have, I can see two questions and probably that's all we've got time for. So let's start off with Carmen at the front here. Hello Introduce everyone, yourself, I'm Carmen please. Figura from WHO. Just a quick question for Hendy. Can you please clarify how did you consider the cost of facility-based testing in the different levels of health facilities? So I say that again, sorry? Can you please explain how do you consider in the model the different levels of health facility, you know, because they're primary, secondary, and tertiary, okay. and uh, it's, yeah. yeah. So, so for the... Can we, get, can we pick the three questions first to be quick, and then we'll, that way we can answer them all. I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep us to time. Let's have the, these two questions, and then the panelists can answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Geoffrey Tassi from Uganda. The first presenter, um, you compared two things, linkage to care for the positives, and then linkage to confirmatory testing. Just needed some more light on that. And then uh, among the three countries, as you evaluated, did you look at uh, harm, uh, social harm, potential harm? We missed that. Thanks. 
Hi, uh, Anna Heard from the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, 3IE. And I, wanted, I had a question for Augustine Choco as well. Um, you reported a little bit about um, ways to follow up, and one of them you said you would call them, I think you said you called the male partner to remind them. I was wondering how you received consent to, uh, to call the male partner, and if you called, I think you said one day, and I was wondering, uh, did you notice, it, did you actually call them one day after the woman went home with her HIV self-test kits and had all of the women distributed these test kits to their partners or was that an issue? Thank you very much. So maybe we can start at the far end. Hendy, do you want to start with the... Um, so for the different... Um, so in the economic analysis I undertake, we are looking actually at the, um, the models that are delivered at certain sites and where the health facilities are also working. So we cost those sites. So the ones that we presented were actually in an urban setting in urban Blanta. The stuff that we've costed for um, the firms been um, doing it in the current models have been in, more, in a mixture of urban and semi-urban. And generally, we're not really, like, we're getting a range of different costs, and that's why I was presenting that graph, because at the more rural, decentralized, centers it is quite costly to get um to offer self test to offer testing and it at urban centers it's a lower cost thanks augustine do you want to just re reflect on telephoning people to tell them that their wife's been tested or bringing a test kit home yes thank you very much so uh when the woman collected self-test kit we called the we tried to call the male partner immediately on that day and again after five days um, so that's, that's how that was delivered. Um, and then in terms of consent, so the consent for the male partner was already waived uh, by the institutional review board. So we didn't uh, uh, obtain that, but we, we were asking women for, for consent to actually uh, call the male partner. If they were not comfortable, then we were not uh, getting the phone numbers. Over 90% of women actually reported at the interview to have delivered the self test kit. And Miriam. Uh, I'll start with the social harm potential for, for implementation. Uh, in the community-based distribution, which I said was the, was the biggest model for distribution, uh, are we able to also look at issues of, of social harm? Was our distributors were based in the community. They were recruited from the community with the participation of the community. So, and during distribution, issues of social harm were also part of the issues that would report back to, to us, the implementers. So in all the three countries, uh, we did not get any adverse events that were reported by the community distribution, and this way, this were going to be easier to pick anyway because the, the distributors actually stayed in the communities where they were doing the distribution. Then the, there's the study on the, the slide on linkage. Uh, I hope I got the question right, but there was a comparison of linkage with self-testing and linkage without self-testing for, for confirmatory testing. So that was the comparison on the slide. I don't I'm not sure what the question really required me to, to respond on. I suggest you take it up afterwards or, I mean, luckily we've got a whole few days in front of us and since time is short, I think we should say thank you very much to our panelists. This is a multi-stage event in, in honor of the Tour de France. Um, and I'd now like to invite up our last, our last panel because we've had formative research, we've had some notion of implementation. So we're now going to a panel just to give some reflections on policy and community and the way forward. So I'd, I'd like to invite Lelio back up and Carl um, and Kenley and Jürgen and Dr. Rachel Bagley as my co-chair. So let me introduce my co-chair as she's coming up. Dr. Rachel Bagley is coordinator of HIV prevention um, and key populations at the World Health Organization, has been central to a lot of the work pushing forward the guidance on HIV self-testing, um, and has worked tirelessly with UNITAID 
um, to support the whole star apparatus. Um, and she, when she's had a chance to take her seat, is going to reintroduce Lelio, just to say, I don't know whether you need to reintroduce Lelio. No, I don't think I really need to reintroduce Lelio, but just really to um, congratulate him for um, funding this project, and it's extremely exciting um, to um, be here to witness the next, next phase. So um, this is a very important day. The, the, we are signing this phase two, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great situation. It's a great momentum of uh, the self-test and the, 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 the number of implications and, and consequences that we have. Um, introducing innovation bringing innovation from the pipelines to the front lines, bringing it to the real world to change the reality is an extremely complex task. And it's a, as a funder, it's amazing how difficult it is because of the multidimensional character and uh, the, the, the number of actors involved, um, the different interests and agendas starting by the donors and ending by the implementer countries, dealing with the industry, with WHO, with the civil society creating demand, with market issues, with the big donors for scaling up. Um, it's extremely complex and uh, we are very proud at UNITED uh, operating in this niche that is so important and so catalytic for making the response cheaper and faster and more effective. So this STAR project, as, as we were saying, brought a lot of things, evaluated feasibility and acceptability, piloted distribution mechanisms, provided evidence, um, contributed to lower prices. So the pilots are completed now. And now we have PQ products plus the guidance for using it. We have an ancient and evolving market, small market, but promising, and it starts. We have the civil society fully on board, pushing very hard on the government to, to adopt and to invest in that. We have the industry behind us, genericers and also uh, originators. I mean, all the, the, the industry is interested in that. We have an affordable price. Gates and Orasher signed this fabulous agreement for 50 countries already, but others are coming because we want to promote competition and not only uh, oral fluid tests, but also blood-based. We have political support from some governments. We hope we will have more. So now the big challenge, the big challenge now will be the scale-up, scalability of this. How are we going to do for civil society, continuing their work and enhancing demand and, cre and, and, and pushing for that, governments really buying the idea and introducing it in their national strategies, using the CCMs, the country coordinating mechanisms, for asking the Global Fund to fund it, country-driven model, remember, we cannot just, it's, it's them asking the fund to, to, to fund these, to include the self-testings in the, in, the, in the national envelopes. PEPFAR is already on board. We will be, the United Project will be buying, Robert, four million tests in the next two years. We know already that some countries are uh, including in their global fund envelopes major amounts of money, and, 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 and it depends on the price, of course, on the quantities, but, but it, it's becoming a reality. So all these elements are giving us an idea of how important was this catalytic investment in STAR 1. STAR 2 will be even more aggressive, and, 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 and starting with South Africa, which is really what we want to, to hit hard. So Yogan. <laughs> uh, so a lot of, of work to, to do here 
Um, so again, thank you very much. Thank you, all of you, the implementers, the team, Robert, Judith, and, uh, and all the team at Unitate, at PSI, at uh, SFH, at the London School. So thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks, Lelio. And I, I think that, you know, we all see this is a, a really major change in the way we think about testing. And that comes with, you know, with challenges and things as well. And, and, and we've heard some of those raised even in the, in the conversation here today. One of the key issues is that this is really moving tests out into the community. And that means that, you know, we're, we're not always comfortable with that as health providers, as, as researchers, you know, releasing some of that power. And so I think it's really interesting to get the view from the community side. And I'm delighted that we've got Kenley Sequazi from the AfroCab, the, the um, community advisory board um, that, that serves as an international advisory board. And Kenley, we'd really welcome your thoughts about what self-testing might mean for, for communities, in, particularly in Africa. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I think the, I think well, Lelio forgot something very important. He forgot to thank his board. Um, <laughs> so I, sh I shall report that to the chair. <laughs> um, but you know, self-testing is, is an interesting development. Um, I think it was a few years ago when Michelle Sidibe was screaming about revolutionizing and democratizing uh, testing approaches and this was you know four or five years ago and perhaps now this is uh, uh, the beginning of a, a really truly revolutionary approach to uh, testing and reaching those people that have been very difficult I mean, if you think about it that since the 1980s well maybe say since 1990 anybody born since 1990 this is a group of people that probably uh, don't have the kind of baggage that I have because I saw, I was old enough to see people get infected, people die. I think, you know, any Zambian or any African in Southern Africa would tell you that we spent so much time at funerals. That, you know, a good 30, 40% easily per year as we saw friends, brothers, sisters die. But that came with some baggage so that we are conscious of those, uh, of that era and averse to, you know, anything that lightens an approach to HIV such as self-testing. And so we were all scared, oh my goodness, if they bring self-testing, how many people we were here committing suicide? How many people are going to go into depression? How many people? And this pilot was so important and so critical. I think Lelio will tell you that some of us who saw some potential in this approach, you know, we're pushing that this is a new era. This is a new group of people. This is not for dinosaurs like me. This is for young people that did not see, unfortunately, those deaths because they also take then things like HIV lightly. But for the purpose of self-testing, it brought a great opportunity to bring them in, rein them in, rein in my friends who would never walk into a VCT. And they kept on asking when I first heard about self-testing at the first you know, two AIDS conferences away, where is this self-test, Kenley? I will have a test if there is available. And it's not surprising that we've seen more men take up testing, uh, self-testing. And not only, and, and I think if also, also remember that we are averse to pain. So being a, you know, a saliva-based test was also another incentive. So when you come to you know, pricking, I, I mean, anyway, it will be, might be a different story. But so this is a very, very interesting development and I think we should embrace it and accept it and, and, and ensure that we really get buy-in from all our communities and disseminate the stories about self-testing. This, this is a generation that believes in instant packages, you know, and, and so we need to really respond in that sense and use all the technologies that we have, WhatsApp, you know, all our mobile technologies to ensure that people know that they can actually in their secret space access self-testing self services. I just want to finish by just also recognizing the fact that um, the critical thing, I think somebody asked a very important question about social harms. And I was a little also disappointed that we did not go into social harms so that we you know, acknowledge that there is always potential. And we also begin to try and think how we can mitigate against all those social harms and, and plan our programs better. But the big news is that this is time to change. This is time to innovate 
and this is time to, to, to really embrace new ideas and acknowledge that the right to know your test, the right to know your status is equally important to every human right. Thank you very much. It gives me great pleasure um, to introduce Carl Hoffman, who is the CEO of PSI, um, Population Services International. And speaking on behalf of, of WHO, we've really relished working with PSI on the STAR project. It's been um, a wonderful time working with your fantastic team led by Karen. So um, great that you're here um, to, <coughs> to speak as their leader. Thank you. May I? Thank you very much, Rachel. Et euh, merci à vous tous d'être restés si tard ce soir. Um, Kenley, let me, let me be the first to thank the UNITAID board. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, because uh, obviously the action they've decided to take in endorsing this next phase of the initiative is very important to us and all of the partners. Um, I want to associate myself with the words of Lelio when talking about the catalytic nature of this activity. I mean, when you think about it, it really has generated a change in behavior uh, among so many different actors uh, in this space, WHO being one of them, um, uh, producers, those who are responding to the newly emerging market for HIV self-testing, and we've seen important developments in recent weeks in that, in, in that regard, governments, and how they are looking differently at the regulatory framework and understanding all of these issues that this beautiful research has brought to light about the effectiveness of this approach, the effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of this approach. Um, and not least, I would say uh, it's been tremendously impactful on my own organization. Um, PSI has been around for a long time, and working in HIV prevention and recently HIV treatment as well for a number of years. But this project has really brought home to us a number of different approaches and imposed a lot of humility on us as we've embraced an approach that really took us back to our roots in terms of listening to consumers, embracing consumer insight, embracing empathy and insight and prototyping aspects of human-centered design. I mean, we're on a strategic journey now to reimagine healthcare, and the centerpiece of that is to, wherever possible, bring care back into the hands of the consumer and, and where possible, right to her doorstep or his doorstep. And this project, therefore, for us, is an absolutely pioneering and transformative activity. It has brought us to the need to um, shape the entire market for HIV self-testing along with our partners, to work with governments and international organizations to begin to shift the policy and funding environment, and ultimately to strengthen all of our capacities to respond to this missing part of the HIV response. I would say, you know, to listen to you, Kenley, talking about the reality of anybody who was around in the 1980s or 90s, dealing with what seemed like the hopelessness of the cause and the concerns about this approach and the social harm question that was brought up. But you know, so much of this is familiar also in the context of the basic technology like uh, self-testing self for pregnancy. The same arguments, of course, were deployed against that women would learn they were pregnant and would become despondent and might initiate self-harm if they weren't properly cared for. And we pushed through that appropriately. And I'm pleased that we're pushing through that frontier here as well. So we're just delighted to be a part of this and very proud. And I thank all the people who've been um, able to bring forward this great learning under phase one. And we look forward to the next part of the initiative. Thank you. Carl, thank you very much. Um, so we heard, as, as Karen mentioned, that the phase two, and I think that several people have mentioned that phase two is moving STAR forward. We've had phase one that's been about some formative work, about learning about delivery systems, about costs, and we need to go on 
learning as we do, but phase two is going to expand, and one of the big expansions is to work very closely in three of the most affected countries, uh, of which South Africa is far the biggest, a huge market, a challenging environment, um, um, an incredibly challenged leader who has all these things on his plate all the time when it comes not only to HIV. So I think most of you are very familiar with Dr. Jürgen Pille, the Deputy Director General of the National Department of Health in South Africa, who leads not only the HIV response, but many other things as well. And Jürgen, it's your job to reflect a little bit on what self-testing and STAR Phase 2 will mean for South Africa. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me say I tweeted earlier on about what I think the hot topics from this conference are going to be, and already are, and I said just two things, PrEP and self-testing. And one of my very good friends said, well, what about HIV drug resistance? So I'm adding a third. So those will be my three top takeaways from this conference. Uh, I'd like to join others in thanking Unidate and Lilio in particular and the board uh, for both investing in the demos, funding the research, as well as... Uh, moving from phase one to phase two, and specifically including South Africa in phase two. And including the researchers, I'd like to thank the people who tested these kits in the various communities that did. In 2010, South Africa did, uh, held a national HIV testing campaign, and already then we found that men and adolescents weren't testing at the same rate as women. Uh, I was, I must say, gobsmacked in the 2016 Demographic and, House and Health Survey, which found that 10 to 19-year-old South Africans in 2016 didn't know where to get an HIV test. And that's in a country with a huge epidemic, 7 million people estimated to have uh, the disease uh, with over almost 4 million on treatment. And I want to quote just four quotations uh, from people in South Africa who tried out the test as part of the uh, VITS RHI uh, program. The first one said, home test is easier and less scary compared to clinics. Clearly people don't like to go to clinics. Second, it is like pregnancy, as Carl said, but I hope it's affordable. And I guess that's one of the things with volumes we need to think about how we can get it more affordable. Th third, no pressure, make your own decision. And I think this focuses on empowering individuals, but I dare say it's also empowering communities to, for communities to participate. And fourth, it brings confidence in knowing one's own result first, and it's easy to use. So I think from what we heard from the researchers and from what I've been hearing from my colleagues in South Africa, I think there's going to be significant appetite for its use. We'd like to thank WHO for at last, I've been harassing Rachel for the last 18 months or so about when WHO is going to pre-qualify the, the first test. So I'd like to congratulate WHO. But I think I'd like to join Debbie Burks to ask WHO to move faster on PQing these tests. Uh, the more tests we have, I think, the better. In South Africa, I've been harassing the clinicians to think about calling it a self-screening test rather than a self-testing uh, kit, largely because you know, we have to focus on the confirmatory part as well, as well as the linkage to care. So I want to put it out there uh, for the colleagues as well beyond South Africa, but I've been harassing my colleagues in South Africa. I'm very, in, you know, impressed with the projections that we've done that will show us how far self-testing or self-screening can get us to the first 90. And I think for countries in the Southern African region, that's going to be very important um, and I think we should do a few more projections to look at, you know, what lift do we need using and what lift uh, self-testing or self-screening can give us to get to the first 90. Um, where can we use it in South Africa? I think i uh, follow the, 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 the research very closely. I think in antenatal clinics, as was pointed out, uh, among sex workers, uh, in VMMC clinics, uh, on, in young people, clearly men, in PrEP sites, and I dare say in STI clinics too, and for me, it's going to be equally important for retesting and frequent retesting. Because I think the more we can get people in the acute phase of the infection on treatment, the better for all of us, including population level uh, changes in incidence. So we look forward in South Africa to implementing phase two. And we would like to, uh, Lilio, include in these groups that I've mentioned, at least to try it out as part of phase two, in our 27 nas 2017 national testing campaign, 
which is going to be part of our prevention revolution because clearly we are not doing sufficiently in South Africa to decrease the number of new infections in South Africa, which currently stand at around 740 new infections per day. So self-testing um, will be part of our prevention revolution as well as linkage to uh, care uh, and antiretrovirals. Thank you very much. So the peloton is racing towards the Arc de Triomphe. It hasn't quite got there yet. But I realize that we're slightly over time. Um, so I'm going to keep very short some, some closing remarks and then ask Rachel just to make some closing remarks. First of all, I think that we should appreciate straight up front the, the I think we have done several times, but I'd like to reiterate the vision of unit aid in, in taking this forward as a, as a transformative technology. And that means also, therefore, acknowledging the support to UnitAid from the main donors of UnitAid, the governments of France, of the United Kingdom, of Brazil, of Korea, Norway, Chile, um, and also the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, because they've been prepared to put their confidence behind UnitAid to do this sort of thing. We've heard a lot, and I think, Jürgen, you've summed up brilliantly for, for South Africa, and these are, many of these things are generic, that there are many, many things we don't yet know about how H HIV self-screening or self-testing will work. Part of the challenge, as we heard in some of the presentations today, is that people can do them on their own. So those of us who are used to trying to count numbers, like we are in UNAIDS, it becomes much more difficult. And should we be trying to get people to return tests? But if you ask them to return tests, nobody does, or only half the people in any way, they no longer make sense when you reread them. So we have to give up control to communities and allow people to be testing themselves. But that does make it harder for us to know exactly what the impact is, who's using them, how they're using them. And I think we'll, we'll have to see that, that happening. So we can see that the HIV self-test is a complex intervention and it requires therefore investigation along a number of different pathways, not just quantitative but also qualitative and in, in the social science arena to understand the changes that it makes in people's lives. We do believe, and UNAIDS certainly believes, that self-testing is a very important part of allowing people to know their status, particularly those who we're missing at the moment. That is crucial for getting people onto treatment, which is crucial for keeping people alive. We've seen that getting people on treatment is not enough yet to bring down the number of new infections globally, and it's falling, but not falling quickly enough, and with not enough inflection as we've seen treatment scale up. So I think that a big question is whether more people knowing their HIV negative status will also allow changes in behavior and to use the HIV self-test as a real prevention tool, as well as a tool for finding positives to put them on treatment. We've heard a lot about the issues of affordability, and clearly we need to be pushing hard for these tests to become cheaper and cheaper. We support very much the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in making some efforts in that direction with their co-funding agreements, but unless these tests do become cheaper and cheaper, they will not be affordable. And we mustn't be complacent. To some extent, this is a celebration of self-testing and, and the next phases, but it's not easy. And, and we are still in a period where we're wanting millions and millions of people to choose to, to find out their HIV status. Millions and millions of self-tests cost millions and millions of dollars. So it, we do have a, a way to go. Um, however, I think that you know, my, my boss, Michel Sidibe, forever says, don't talk about costs, talk about investments. Um, and you know, many people have taken the line of, well, if you don't pay now, you'll certainly pay later. So we know that we're at a stage where we are getting on top. We have more people on treatment. More than half the people living with HIV in the world are on treatment, which is a terrific achievement. So we mustn't lose the momentum that we've got, and we mustn't let the costs prevent us from doing that. With that, I'd like to say thank you very much for all your attention and pass to Rachel, who is going to make a few closing remarks and then close the session. Rachel. Thank you very much. Um, I won't be, I'll, I'll be very brief as well, um, as, as um, uh, um, we need to.
um, finish this session. Um, we really are at a pivotal time, and as Jürgen says, WHO is, is slow and um, inefficient, and certainly we wouldn't be our, where we are today without unitated investment in self-testing um, and the STAR giving us the results so we could make um, the recommendation for self-testing and partner notification that Cheryl Johnson led in December. And eventually the pre-qualification, we will continue to push for the new products. Because self-testing, although it seems new, isn't really that new. And it really did take um, the STAR project to get us where we are. Um, I remember in 2010, um, Liz Corbett, who um, couldn't be here, unfortunately, really, who's been the, the kind of driving force um, but, but with, with self-testing from the very beginning. She, she and Sue wrote a paper in 2010, one of the first self-testing papers, showing that, that um, nurses and um, doctors um, in, in, in Southern Africa, at least 40% of them had self-tested. And I think what was okay for them um, uh, is now being understood to be okay for others. And I really take Kenley's point. We're at a different time. I think, um, you know, 10 years ago, um, 20 years ago, when, when there was so much um, uh, fear about testing, so much stigma, it, it was, um, would have been a frightening thing. But we've now reached a stage where it's so imperative that people um, learn and get linked immediately to treatment for their own benefit um, and, and for the benefit of their, their, their families and loved ones. And, um, and really encouragingly, um, and I want to again thank the STAR Project for being very uh, meticulous about recording um, social harms, and we will continue to do that. Um, it seems that uh, social harms are very, very low. And I think you know, putting power into people's hands, um, um, and people make sensible decisions. People don't um, offer self-test kits to their partners if they think their partners are horrible. Um, and they make very rational decisions about that. And I think we have to trust and respect and support our partners. And I think, uh, again, um, Kenley, um, we are committed um, to engaging with um, civil society. Mm. And in fact, in a couple of weeks, time um, we at WHO working with um, with Jürgen are going to have a, a small community consultation um, in our WHO office in, in South Africa um, with communities um, uh, and networks to really start that decision and, and start those discussions before the self-testing is, is rolled out there. So really exciting um, results from from this, this, this session um, and from the STAR <coughs> projects. Fantastic, we're reaching exactly who we want to reach. We want reaching men, reaching young people. Um, people love it, people can do it. It's not perfect, but no testing is perfect. Um, we have to emphasize the need to retest all positives and we need to do everything we can to link people to care. I think with the next phase, which is extremely exciting now to expand to three other countries, more models will be explored, um, more um, uh, uh, ways of, uh, um, of, of delivering and linking. Um, and am I allowed to say this? Um, we're also hoping that there'll be self-testing with some of the PrEP projects, um, um, so to increase, again, the geographical um, uh, knowledge um, in Latin America, Asia, um, and, as you said, in West Africa. So I think with, with STAR Phase 2 and the other Unitaid investments, um, we really will have everything we need um, to really stimulate um, self-testing and make it much more um, available everywhere. So that's really all I want to say, and, and, and uh, thank you all for staying so late. It's been a fabulous session, and many, many congratulations to the STAR team. Could we just add one final one, which is thanking Peter for this great chairing today. Thanks a lot.